Everybody. Welcome to the Orthodox Logos. My name is Ian Silver. I'm joined with my co-host Nathaniel Harmon, as usual. Greetings. And today we are very blessed to have Father John Valdez. I hope I pronounced your last name right. Yes, thank you. It's a blessing to be with you both. Thank you. Well, we really, really appreciate it. It's been something we've been um, going back and forth in the Instagram DMs about for a while, so I'm glad it's finally come to fruition. And you have a pretty interesting story, and I'll, I'll give like a brief overview. You converted from Protestantism in 2006, along with 30 people, from a tattoo parlor Bible study, which I'll have to ask you about that. And then if, if people aren't familiar, you took the reins, so to speak, with Death to the World, which is a huge inspiration and a, a blessing in the community, um, with the blessing of the abbot, who is now the, the bishop. Nathan, you're better at pronouncing names. Garasim? That's... Yeah, uh, yeah at St. Herman's. Um, you got married in 2012 to your wife, Presbytera Christina. I hope I'm saying that right. Yes. And then you went to seminary and you were ordained in 2017, graduated and assigned to St. Timothy in Lom Lompoc, Lompoc. <laughs> Lompoc um, California. And I have a friend or an acquaintance who lives out there. We don't talk as much, but I know it's uh, a little rural, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a nice. But that's 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 a little bit. That's my introduction. I'm sure. You, <laughs> I'm sure you know more about yourself than I do. So. Um, yeah. So uh, the the tattoo parlor Bible study. I guess. Um, are you guys familiar with Father Turbo Qualls? Yes. He's been kind of floating around on the YouTube world and things like that. Um, but he was the uh, tattoo artist that really? led a Bible study. Um, at the parlor itself. Um, a lot of us uh, who gathered there came from a kind of underground Protestant punk rock scene. And, you know, it was, it's kind of interesting looking back on it. It was really like my first church. Even though I went to some other churches, it was really my first community or first church. Um, we would all, you know, come to shows together uh, with mohawks and spiky hair and all kinds of things, tattoos and piercings and stuff, and um, had um, like hardcore punk rock shows. And then at the very end of the show, they'd bust out acoustic guitar and pray and, and do like Protestant uh, worship songs. Um, and so, but we were really searching for some kind of authentic Christianity, a Christianity that was not of this world, a Christianity that... Um, didn't embrace the American dream that so many of us were sick of or disillusioned with because we had so many, you know, broken families um, within our own community and things like that. Um, so we all uh, started going to this Bible study that uh, now Father Turbo had started and hosted at his parlor. And so on Monday nights after the lights went out and the tattoo guns stopped tattooing we would we would study scripture until sometimes until the sun came up the next day and um we were just really searching for some kind of authentic christianity some authentic truth um father turbo tells a little bit better about how he discovered orthodoxy but um he had stumbled across books he had stumbled across um an icon inside of um his wife's um, manager's house or whatever. He went to the house. He saw an icon hanging up the wall and the guy was a, uh, he was Coptic, um, but the icon really struck him as an artist and he, it just started this snowball effect uh, for him spiritually seeking out um, orthodoxy. And eventually a few years later, he became orthodox and he brought, uh, he inspired about 30 of us to join him and become Orthodox as well. And then the next year, another 25 or 30 people 
did um, as well. And then it kind of like trickled, people trickled in here and there after that. But that was the, that was our, our tattoo parlor conversion. Um, wow. so, so you put down, they put down the tattoo guns and picked up their crosses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I yeah like it. You can imagine, you know, our, our home parish that where we are received baptized in, um, was mostly made up of kind of white middle-class, um, you know, Orthodox Christians. And so one Sunday, if you can imagine just all of these spiky haired tattoo people came and infiltrated, you know, the divine liturgy. It sounds similar to, uh, that's, to that's me. what happened with him. He, he came <laughs> in there you on go. The, it was so, Vespers. I think it was halfway through great Lent last year on my Harley. Well, and he, he, he comes in and I, I came in a few minutes after he did. And I'm sitting there looking at this guy because I was standing a little bit behind him and I was like, oh man, he's got long hair and I can see that he's wearing a cross, but I couldn't see if it was a metal baptismal cross or not. And I was like, ah, okay, he's got a beard. He's got the hair. He's got a cross. I think, I don't know if this guy's Orthodox or not. He probably could be. And then at <laughs> some point I walked past him and saw it was a wooden cross. I was like, oh no, this guy's definitely an inquirer. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and I was uh, trying to figure out how to cross myself and well, I was standing behind you. I couldn't see what, yeah. how you were crossing yourself. I do all the things. But I think that's interesting, uh, given kind of my background. And <clears throat> I'll tell you what, we weren't staying up in tattoo shops <laughs> until the sun came up reading scripture. That was not, I wish that we had been doing that. So it's a beautiful story that although, you know, you guys were still doing some things that I guess we wouldn't do now as Orthodox Christians, when the lights went off, so to speak, you know, you were trying to find a deeper truth. And I think, I think that's amazing. Yeah. And what's interesting about it and this bleeds into the death of the world thing is that a lot of the bands that we went and saw and uh, a lot of their logos and their lyrics and slogans that were kind of part of this scene, um, were all taken from death to the world magazines, but we had no idea. So in, um, the nineties, the monks went to Cornerstone Festival. I've been I've I've heard of that. That's like the big Christian Yeah. Huge secular. festival from all over the country. Bands come together. Under oath. Yeah. Those type of bands. Yeah, yeah. So in the nineties they set up a booth there and these bands met the monks and they got Death of the World magazines and they basically um plagiarized uh, lyrics and other things from them, uh, but left out all the, you know, quote unquote, scary Catholic stuff as they would thought they thought the it theology. Was. Yeah. Um, so all of the slogans that really drew us into this whole life and inspired us to search were all Orthodox to begin with. Um, it was just kind of kept behind closed doors. And later that came to light. And um, the the abbot at the time of the monastery, Father Garasim, as you said, now he's Bishop Garasim in the OCA, Fort Worth, Texas. Um, but he sent us a huge box full of old Death of the World issues and Youth of the Apocalypse books, which are like really expensive on eBay now. <laughs> um, but he said this is good information kind of leading into our first topic as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Oh. So he so he um sent us all that stuff and he told us a church to go to and we started attending. And um the death of the world stuff and the youth of the apocalypse books just totally fulfilled everything that we were looking for and gave us the answers to everything that we were looking for so what, what year was that in when you when you took over i guess it would be the right way to say it when you started you know picked up where death of the world uh left off what, what year was that in 2006 right after we were baptized wow and okay i was going to the monastery like every month uh as a catechumen and um asking and, and we would always ask them if they were making new issues because we were taking them, we were Xeroxing them and passing them out at punk shows already. So we wanted new, new issues to come out. And when it got close to the time of being baptized, they said, you know, well, why don't after you, after you're baptized, put one together, send it up here. 
we'll edit it, look over it, and then give a blessing to print it. And so that's how it worked for the first, you know, mm-hmm. few years. That's the way. most punk rock way to do zines, too. If people don't know, the true zine is where you Xerox it, and then you Xerox the Xerox, <laughs> and you keep until you get the most low-quality zine possible. That's exactly, like exactly. a punk way to do it. But yeah, um, I, I don't understand why that's a thing. Like that does. I'm not gonna lie. That doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> I was. It's punk rock. It's not supposed to make sense. Yeah. Well, it, it's it's you know these zines they circulate at shows and they're filled with all kinds of stuff like interviews with people from bands or information about something or some kind of political thing or something like that and they're they're kind of cut and pasted together, you know. And then there's Xerox in a Xerox machine. And then your then the one that you hand it to to your friend, your friend Xerox it. Xerox that and, <laughs> and spread it, right? And then another person can Xerox it and spread it. So it's a total under it's a whole underground press, basically. That's, that's very that, that sounds very much like um a, a virus, just the way yeah. viruses work and the the yeah. added the, the accretions of uh, the, the poor quality accretions are just what you might call like um, frame shift mutations or something like that is what it sounds like to me. That's, that's very bizarre. (laughs) Yeah. And um, to be honest, when I came into the church and prior to being received into the church, I was struggling as an artist with, um, you know, I did, I did a lot of photo shoots that weren't appropriate to say the least, you know, it was good money, but it wasn't appropriate. And coming into the church, I don't like using the word, giving up because I don't look at as giving up things. I look as it as freeing yourself from a lot of the things of the world. So I was trying to navigate, okay, how do I remain an artist and become an Orthodox Christian? And it was a struggle for me. So when I saw your magazine or when I saw Death of the World, I was like, oh wow. I was like, I can still use my graphic design skills. I can still take photos. Yeah. I can do these things, but in a manner to glorify God. So as you know, uh, I started a zine, and I always pay pay homage to Death of the World uh, and the Orthodox Word, which I didn't know was a thing until, uh, I don't know, six months ago with Nathan. He had a whole stack at his house, and I was like, the Orthodox Logos, the Orthodox Word. I was like, uh, so, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that it was like kind of the same name. I, I think you're one of the first... I think you're one of the first people I met that came into the church that had read Father Seraphim but didn't know anything about his life. Yeah. <laughs> Father Seraphim rose like I was like, oh yeah, I read, I, read, Alan Watts. I read Orthodox or I read the Orthodoxy and the Religion of the Future and the Soul After Death, and these are awesome. And then I'm like, Oh yeah, well, this is Father Seraphim's magazine. And he goes, He had a magazine? Yeah. <laughs> what the heck? <laughs> so I wasn't I wasn't well informed, but I just want to say uh, you know, thanks to you and, and glory to God that we have something like that that kind of made me feel okay with being able to pursue being an artist. And I got the blessing from my spiritual father to do, to do like little issues and, and to do the YouTube, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess leading into our first topic, which is something I brought up is people have been bringing to attention, like this issue of monetizing the faith. And I put it in uh, scare quotes because uh, as Nathan has asked, what, what does that even mean? Can you monetize the faith? Um, is that something that we would consider it or, um, you know, from a clerical perspective, what do you think the boundaries on, on something like that is? Well, I think that in many ways, it's, it's just out of practicality, you know, um, death of the world, for instance, if we didn't sell anything, um, we couldn't continue to produce things and, as a priest, for instance, with five children and a lot of other things going on, I wouldn't be able to devote the time um, needed for it if there wasn't some kind of thing to help support um, taking my time away from other things, if, if that makes sense. And so I don't think we should monetize the faith <clears throat> in a really cheesy way. Um, even saying monetizing the faith might be a little bit cheesy in and of itself, you know, but, um, we do have to, out of practicality, if we're devoting our whole time to a certain thing, um, or a ministry, there has to be some fruits that come from it. I mean, we even see that in acts, right. And the distinguishing between, um, the priesthood and the, and the diaconate and all these kinds of things. Right. And Paul talks about in his epistles as well. 
right? right. They didn't, um, First Timothy, I believe he talks about the whole notion that uh, a worker is worthy of his wages. Exactly. Exactly. So there's, there's definitely a, a scriptural foundation for it. There's a um, practical foundation for it, you know, but when we make the faith like gimmicky, um, and like live, laugh, love Jesus t-shirts or yeah. like that. Yeah. Or, or, um, I can't think of anything like a good, good example of the top of my head, but when we make it gimmicky and we really are just pushing it so hard to try to make money off of it, then, then that's, then that's another issue. So you know, one but, might um, iconographers, for instance. Iconographers have to make money, you know, um, they can't just sell their icons for free. Um, same thing with yeah. church, ar- church architects and woodworkers and um, investment makers, you know, these the things church have in to... general. Mm-hmm. The church in general, we collect money, you know, to keep the church running. Well, especially since we don't live in a political system that allows for the state to say, hey, we recognize the necessity of a strong christian faith in the country so we're going to sponsor it although we do kind of still see that with the tax exempt status of clergy and occasionally with some religious organizations which casts a rather wide net but still yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i I think you make a good point though that's kind of where i've been struggling and i'm not going to say i've done it right or i've done it wrong but i'm learning and with the blessing of my spiritual father and you know with criticism that you know I take I take the criticism criticism as well as I can, but sometimes just you know people have reached out to me. Should I not make these things? Should I not sell these things? I don't want to seem like I'm trying to sell orthodoxy. And I think there's a fine line, and it also has a lot to do with where is your intention? Mm-hmm. You know, like do you want to be giving back to your community? Do you want to be what? Why are you doing it? Do you want to drive a Mercedes, or do you want to be able to put food on your table, um, give more money for your church, spread the spread the gospel? And I think there's like a, a boundary and I, I'm not sure if I've crossed it or, you know what I mean? It's something that I struggle with just as an artist prior to orthodoxy. Like, am I doing the right thing or how am I coming off? So mm-hmm. I think it's a uh, kind of, yeah. Do you have anything to say about that? Oh, Father John, do you have anything else you wish to say? I've got a thought or two, but uh, oh, that'll that's keep. Scary. That's a scary thing. He has thoughts. <laughs> just one or two. Go ahead, Nathan. So, I, w- I want to ask you a question, actually, Father. Do you think that in some way, shape, or form, the best example of what it means to sell the faith or to monetize the faith is actually the example of Simon Magus? Um, I was glancing over that story today. It was actually in one of um, St. Theophan, the recluse's devotional texts for daily readings. He talks about that. He's been talking about it for the last couple of days. Yeah, And he doesn't really talk about the whole notion that but that quite literally buying and selling um, clerical offices acquires Simon Simon's name. Mm-hmm. But it seems to me that that story does kind of touch on this notion of buying and selling the faith because Simon Magus is quite literally trying to buy the Holy Spirit because he thinks that it's just a gimmick he can do to get a greater following. Um would you, would you say that that has any bearing on this whole debate or is that just way too far out there? I think it has some bearing. Yeah. I mean, officially when we talk about priests or other, um, other clergy members charging for sacraments, for instance, it's, it's called simony, right? right. So like you, like you had mentioned. So yeah, I think that it does have some kind of um, loose bearing to, to what we're talking about. For sure. Yeah, I mean, I know you're. You can tip tip the priest. I know it's kind of like I've heard it kind of. That's used, a thing. I've kind of heard it as as a joke, but like if if uh you know, Father, if you came to my house and did a house blessing, I've heard that people will you know pay you for your time. It's not that they're paying you for your blessing; they're paying you for the time that you've taken out of your day or you know covered gas money. I'm not sure if that's something that's acceptable, but I've heard you know tip your priest. I'm not sure if that's a real thing or, you know, where the boundary lies with that? No, it is, it is a thing. Um, and usually, you know, um, there's, they come mostly from like certain cultures, you know, 
-hmm. Like I can go to convert's house and that doesn't happen. But if I go to like a Russian's house or an Arab person's house, that's definitely either I'm going to get like some kind of meal. So I shouldn't eat beforehand <laughs> or, or yeah, they'll give, you know, money and they'll say, you know, take your wife out or, or buy something for your kids or whatever it may be, you know, they're not paying for the, the blessing or the service, but it's mostly like a gift of the priest, I guess. Okay. Yeah. I've always heard tip your priest. And I'm like, I'm not sure how I, if I like that. <laughs> I, I don't I think, think I've ever the, heard that. the line, you know, is it's it, would that be a gimmicky t-shirt father? Yeah. Tip tip your priest. Priest? Yeah, probably. <laughs> I will disassociate myself from you. If you start making t-shirts like that. Uh, perfect. Now I know what to do. Oh, there's a lot of things you could do for that. Um, the, the other observation I wanted to make as well is, interestingly, I've never heard anyone level accusations against, uh, well, post-mortem accusations against C.S. Lewis for selling his books, the vast majority of which were Christian tractates or volumes of some kind. Right. Um, although during his life, there were accusations that he was selling his books, who he, he was using the Christian faith to become very rich. But then it came out after his repose when uh, I believe his brother outlived him by several years, but his brother released the some papers from C.S. Lewis's estate. And it came to light that he had given well over 50 percent of his annual income since becoming a Christian to charity. And it wasn't like, you know, five thousand pounds or whatever to the Red Cross. It was people who would write him. And say, hey, I'm having trouble. How do I resolve this? And he would cut them a check and send it to them. Mm -hmm. And I think, like Ian was saying earlier, if if your goal in doing Christian art is to become wealthy, or even I, I would extend this to say, if your goal in doing art is to become wealthy, you're no artist. <laughs> and you certainly aren't a Christian artist because you've missed the point. But yeah, and you're, I mean, real quick, I feel like I'm not, I'm not clergy, so I, who, who knows if it's right, but I feel like you're damning yourself. Well, yeah, well, it's, it's avarice. Way, it's know? avarice either way. But it, it's, it seems to me that if you are blessed with success as a Christian artist, especially, that your charity ought to increase at the same time. And if that's happening, then it doesn't seem to me that you're selling the faith. Um, it seems to me that you're passing on the blessings that God has given you and storing up treasures in heaven. And if you live long enough to see the wheel of fortune turn you on your head again, then hopefully um, you're, you're setting yourself up for other people to aid you as well, if that becomes necessary. I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into that. No, I, I think that's a good point. Yeah, well, I mean, the whole, the whole motive that we start out with, you know, in pursuing something like this is, are we going, we want to bring other people into an otherworldly life. Right. And want to we want people to transcend this mundane worldly chaotic society right and to find some truth in their own life and that's the motive right. um if a lot of suffering comes and poverty because of that then may it be blessed if a lot if if some money comes in, we're able to support a family because of it, then may it be blessed. You know, if it crashes and burns and leaves us destitute, may it be blessed. Yeah. God's you know? will be done. I think that's the, that's the, how we have to look at it, you know? Um, and there's a lot of reasons why we have to use money to support ourselves in order to continue to do the things that we do. Yeah, I recently just lost my three thousand dollar a month job in the medical field due to religious discrimination, which we won't go into. But I'm kind of fighting it, and that's why I've been making such a push with the Orthodox Logos and with me and Nathan are going to be starting a publication company and, and doing like some Synaxarians or reaching well, out to. That's if our spiritual father blesses that particular of course, endeavor. Of course. <laughs> But we have ideas to use our skills to glorify God. And it's like now I'm not like just in a dire need for money that I'm pushing it hard, but I'm realizing, okay, maybe I won't be getting this job back. And I've been so blessed to be able to spend time, me and Nathan, doing research. Um, and a lot of the reasons we do the the YouTube videos or the Lives of the Saints is there are people we have I haven't heard of. I get a chance to not only 
share what I'm learning, but I get to learn myself. And I think, you know, there's like this edification all around that. That's why I'm really appreciative of having the blessing to do this, this channel. You know, I'm learning so much about the faith and um, my godfather's a reader. So I've started reading and it's like, I'm getting to really put myself where I never thought I would be. And like, like you said, may it be blessed either way. Like if it completely fails, well then that's uh that's God's will, you know? It's a, a lesson in humility, and I think I've already had to deal with some of that along, <laughs> along this journey. With you know, people have people have called me many names, and you know, it's hard from from being like my past life to not get upset or to not entertain them. And some sometimes I do, but I'm learning slowly to just let go of it. And you know, I have a blessing to do it, so it's it doesn't really matter too much what other people think, unless they're clergy or you know, if that makes sense. So. Mm. Yeah, I think basically the main point well, it's, from it's, the... it's like what I've been telling you for quite some time, and that is that. Uh, oh man, I completely lost my train of thought. What was that? I don't know why ah. my uh, computer just told me I have 10 minutes left on this meeting. I've never seen that before. That's weird. Mm. Might have to stop and then go back, go back on real quick and finish up the last topic. Okay. Nathan, do you remember what you were going to say? Uh, yes, and that is even I, as ignorant as I am of social media and how to do the internet thing and live the technological life, even I know you don't read the comments section. <laughs> yeah, it's it gets pretty toxic in there. Yeah, you know, in, internet orthodoxy was like okay 15 years ago. Now uh, hmm. it's completely toxic. Yeah, it's well, it's everything the internet touches, right? Orthodox subreddit horrible place to be you know i haven't even been on there go <laughs> right after i converted me and one of my buddies would go on there occasionally and then at one point there was a significant amount of amount of slander being levied at um the the late um elder ephraim of blessed memory and having been having met him and no, and having known many people who have who were very close with them, I was like, you know, I I, I don't want to be on here anymore. If this is, you know, th this is someone that I'm only I'm not even a degree removed from, and I this is just unbased. And yeah, terrible. our spiritual father is a spiritual child of Elder Ephraim, mm -hmm. so you know, very. I never got the chance to meet him, unfortunately, but I've heard so many amazing stories about him, and we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens in the future with. Yeah, can be canonized. He's incredible. All right. So now that we've talked about the very minor things of conversion and uh, monetizing the faith, we wanted to talk about um, abortion. And I know this was something that I, I don't know if you brought it up to Ian, Father, or if um, Ian brought it up to you, or if it was just kind of a perfect storm of circumstances coinciding with the interview, but uh, we've seen a lot of madness um, that's come to the front lately. And I mean, it's not new, I guess, but it's it's pretty crazy. I mean, what, what, what do you, I, I have thoughts on it, but it's very hard for me to talk about this topic and not be uncharitable. It's, sure. Well, I guess we should say what the topic is. I don't know. We don't have to beat around the bush with the, in light of uh, the Roe v. Wade <laughs> Um, being potentially overturned and just a big topic within the Christian community, um, abortion. And, you know, can you be a Christian and can you be pro-choice? And my opinion of that is definitely not. And I guess we would like some clerical clerical perspective on on, on the whole topic, if, if you don't mind. Um, yeah, well, I would agree with you. Absolutely not, uh, first off. Um, secondly... You know, when things happen in this world, um, while things are happening in the church simultaneously, there's no coincidence. You know, the world is always performing its own inversion of the liturgy and its own inversion of the sacramental life. You know, uh, we saw this a few years ago with the George Floyd riots, which right. were marked by the bowing of the knee right? A uh, very physical gesture. And 
we were celebrating at that time Pentecost, which right. is the bowing of the knees, right? The kneeling prayers. I hadn't made that connection. Yeah. Yeah. So it's things Very like symbolic. that, you know, that um, happened a lot during the during the whole Covidian crisis of everything. Um, over and over again, I think liturgically and while we were celebrating feasts, things were happening. And now I think we're seeing a very similar thing, which last week is when really things came to a head on uh, this issue. And we were ramping up to celebrate the feast of the Merbearing Women and also coinciding with Mother's Day, right? And so on the one hand, we have these women who, against all worldly wisdom and against all of their uh, logical faculties, if you will, went to the tomb of Christ, not even knowing how to roll away the stone in order to bring um, costly ointments and gifts to our Savior who was laying in the tomb, or they thought was laying in the tomb. And um, then on the other hand... Spoiler spoiler alert, right? Yeah. yeah. Then we have, on the other hand, women in the streets crying out for the right to murder their children. Um, And so this, this contrast couldn't be any more stark than, than what it is. So um, you have in the church us celebrating our Lord's Lord's crucifixion, his redemption by his blood and the resurrection and us being raised out of that tomb with him. And then in the world, they're using the blood of innocence to proclaim liberty and to proclaim um, a life that is free uh, from any kind of bonds or cares. Um, if you will, what they would consider the the tomb of traditionalism. Um, so we have these two different uh, lives, these two totally different outlooks on the world. One that rejoices in the murder of children and proclaims the right to carry out that kind of murder as uh, a freedom and a liberty. And then on the other hand, we have the mother of God as the leader of the myrrh bearers coming to anoint her son's uh, dead body to give herself completely up and go out in the face of all kind of danger in order to give herself and these women to give themselves for their savior and are risen up by his blood, right? And so... It's uh, quite a time for this all to coincide uh, with, 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 you know, together, to, to collide together. And then, like I said, also the kind of secular holiday of Mother's Day um, coinciding with that as well, um, being, of course, more in line or supposed to be more in line with that of the myrrh bearing women than of those that are out protesting in the street for the supposed right um, to murder their own children children in the womb or for other people to be able to murder children in, in the womb. Yeah, and covering themselves in fake, fake blood and ripping apart dolls on the uh, doorsteps of Catholic churches. And yeah, it's, it's, pretty, uh, it's pretty disturbing. I think one of the things people don't realize is that it is a sacrificial ritual that they're performing. And you can either, you know, perform a, a ritual or a sacrifice to the high or to the low. And it's like they've gone about as low as you can possibly go and not realizing that the ultimate sacrifice is like, like you mentioned, Father, uh, the mother of God, self, you know, to self-sacrifice, giving your life up for, for Christ or, you know, for your, ch- for your child. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, it's, it's, become a, it's become an inverted um, sacrament, you know, and, um, I've heard, I heard father Josiah mention this briefly on one of his newer videos as well. It's the untouchable sacrament of, right. Uh, of, of the secular age. And, um, 
And I think, I think I was listening to you guys. That's a somebody, dangerous thing to do, Father. Um, somebody had mentioned um, the use of the Lord's words and twisting them as well. Right? Yeah, I, yeah, I did that in like the one about Megan Fox where the yeah. Body, yeah, how they'll even say prayers backwards or cross themselves backwards. Yes. So you have this, um, this is my body. The same words of He's very familiar here that we say uh, during the liturgy, all right? And um, women proclaiming the same, you know, this is the same kind of slogan, uh, this is my body. Um, but we see, of course, in the life of the Savior and being spoken by the priests in, in the liturgy, this is my body which is broken for you. So it's a give, it's giving, right? Right. Not and taking, yeah. Therefore, it becomes sacrifice and it becomes um, redemptive to the other and it becomes true love, right? But then we have this is my body and my choice, um, on the other hand, which is completely self indulgent and um, selfish in nature and therefore not loving by any means and not freeing by any means. Um, so, yeah, this topic is, is, has always been in the minds of, of Christians from the very beginning and conception of the church. We have even from the, the exactly Didi, has, yeah. Yeah. Um, the murdering of children in the womb. So, I mean, it's just, it's absolutely um, crazy. You know, God will never bless a nation that continues to spill the blood of its own children. And even barbaric nations in the ancient times didn't do the same things that we right. um, promote as freedom today. You know, we have over 60 million abortions in this country. It's that blood is on everybody's hands. That's blood is soaks the soil of this nation. And um, I think that Christians who are supposedly pro-choice that say we should stay out of it and give the rights to other people if they want to do that, it's none of our business, or um, that um, the government shouldn't regulate somebody else, you know, that kind of a thing. I think there's a very shallow understanding of sin in the spiritual life and a very shallow understanding of uh, the government's role in the lives of its people. Um, right. Governments are given and they're given authority in order to usher people into the next life. That's their primary objective. Right. Of course, we don't see that happening very much. <laughs> Um, in our own history is rife with that failure Well, yeah. into, their, into their next life, but it's not a good one. Right, 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 right. So, but it, but it is supposed to safeguard some kind of, um, spiritual health, right. And, um, lead people at least with signposts into hopefully life eternal with God. And, um, so for a nation to, uh, for, or for a government to stay out of these things, it would be neglecting their God-given right as rulers. And um, as far as letting people just do whatever they want to do behind closed doors, of course, we, we respect everybody's free will. Um, God respects everybody's free will. But at the same time, we don't kind of give this open blanket um, we don't just condone it of people can do whatever they want, right? Because sin affects everybody. Right. It doesn't just affect the, the one individual. It spreads out. Um, St. Nikolai Velimirovich says like electricity. Mm -hmm. It touches everybody around us. And we even see in the life of St. Paisios and other saints in, in modern times, right? St. Paisios would take on the responsibility of a war far away from him because he didn't pray enough, right? So sin affects everybody 
around us. It affects the nation. It affects our parish. Um, it affects our family. It affects everybody around us. And so for us to just think that we're kind of this, these individual monads walking around with, without any effect on anybody and we're just doing things behind our closed doors um, is a really shallow outlook on the spiritual life. And so for us to say, let people do whatever they want to do, they don't hold, hold the same values as us, that kind of a thing. It puts not only um, ourselves in danger, our children in danger, but also our nation in danger. It's not true love. It's not sticking up for another person. You know, I've heard Christians say, oh, well, we have to just love everybody, right? It doesn't mean letting them murder people. That's not how that works. There, there's different types of love. And right. We, we have a very shallow understanding of this one word. Um, and not saying something uh, for the innocent child whose life is at risk, that is not love, right? Yeah, I've, had, I've had people say, I'm going to unfollow you. Yeah. Okay. There's, <laughs> there, there's a humorous story, Father. I don't know if you've heard this before, but when the British Empire um, finally extended dominion over India, um, the colonial governor was made aware of the practice of widow burning. Mm. And... You know, because in Hinduism, if the husband dies, the widow is thrown on the pyre, or if she's hardcore, sits on the pyre herself. Um, and when this governor heard about this, he was rather perturbed, as anyone with good Christian sensibilities ought to be. And he called together um, a lot of the Indian royalty or wh whoever it was that was responsible for overseeing these practices and said, okay, look, here's the deal. You're not going to do this anymore. This is wrong. You will not do this anymore. And they said, well, it's our culture and you have to respect our culture. And he said, be that as it may, if you practice your culture, I will practice mine and execute anyone who does this. And they were, they understood very quickly that this was a practice they needed to stop doing. Yeah. Sure. Sure. And I know uh, Nathan, I know you have to go pretty soon, Father, but I know Nathan had some, some points to bring up real quick and, and we'll kind of, we might have to do another part two or something. Uh, you know, about some things, but I know you had some about like, right. you know, regards to sin and like mm -hmm. people thinking there's no consequence. I know Nathan had some, some questions about, about that. Yeah. So um, you're familiar with father Joseph Gleason. He's the, uh, I, I forget what jurisdiction he came from, but he's in somewhere in Russia at the moment. His, yeah. his family moved there. Yeah. 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 He penned an article for Russian faith. I want to say six or so odd months ago, maybe not even quite that long ago talking about how the notion that we think that abortion is murder, but that the woman who aborts her child is not a murderer is a bit of a problem. And he relates several stories uh, from the prologue of Elred and or Elkred or however you say it, in, in which um, people who had committed very grave crimes against society and against the state after they had spent time in monasteries repenting, went back out into the world to receive the just um, consequences of their actions. So my question is, how how should we view this with regard to abortion in modern in the in the modern world? Because it's it's my suspicion, although I'm not sure this is entirely accurate, that in the early days of why of, of legalized abortion after uh, roe versus wade first passed or first was uh, upheld by the supreme court that ignorance over what exactly was happening was a little more common not i don't think that justifies it but i think that in the 70s and early 80s the ability to disseminate information about what was actually going on wasn't as good and therefore some people who were who felt societally pressured into getting an abortion didn't have both eyes open, so to speak, at least not as Seriously. at least not in the way that we do now. I mean, if you get an abortion nowadays, you have to be living under a rock somewhere in sub-Saharan Africa to not know what's being done. Um, what g given that in that, that both eyes open, um, 
engagement with abortion, what ought we to press for as the church? What, what should we be pushing for as, with regard to um, legal repercussions for obtaining an abortion? Um, specifically, if it's the woman or her family that is pushing for that and facilitates that. Because I'm sure there's a, pen, uh, what is, what's the word? Penit, penitent? Penance. Penance. I'm sure there's something, I'm not familiar with the canons, but I'm sure there's something like that. But should there be like a, like a legal repercussion? And I know it's kind of a broad question or a heavy, heavy question, but what, you know, what do you think we should be doing? I mean, with, with regard to, to penances, for instance, for something that's grievous, um, the canons are very harsh about it. Um, but at the same time, many spiritual fathers have to treat this as uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You know, some people can take harsh penances, some can't. Mm -hmm. um, in in Trullo 102, which is a canon, um, they quote Saint Basil talking about the canons are used as medicine. Right. Right. And if you give too much medicine, you'll kill somebody. And if you don't give enough medicine, you'll kill somebody. Right. So the canons are used as a medicine cabinet for spiritual fathers and um, should be used in a way that uh, we know that it will bring healing to the person. Right. And not just slap them down with um, some kind of strict penance that's going to kill them. Right. Um, so forgiveness has no place in this. What's that? So people Vindictiveness has no place in this. Right. And. And it depends on the person, like what's going to be the best for their spiritual state in coming back into the church. You have somebody that, um, for instance, is very old, a woman that's very old, and she got an abortion a very long time ago and has been suffering with this for many, many, many years. You know, it's going to be different um, in dealing with in confession and giving a penance uh, rather than somebody who's, say, very active in the church and falls one one weekend or something and and is lost and gets an abortion come back the next month and comes to church right this person is going to have a different penance than the old woman would have right. um, most likely and so i can't speak to you know what a law maybe should look like or should be um, but at the same time it 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 ought to uh, maybe reflect the way in which we deal with these things on a one-on-one -on -one basis. Um, because at least these things um, in confession are how people are to heal their souls, you know? Right. Um, if we had some kind of law in, in the United States that made this, this offense punishable, then maybe that would deter people, you know? And that's, I think, what laws are for to deter people from doing things that are morally wrong. Right. The, the specific example that I have in mind is with regard to the awareness of what's going on thing anyway, with a video clip that came out several years ago, um, I lose track of time these days, but this, it's this young woman in Southern California or New York or something like that. You know, one of these very, very lovely places with, uh, reasonable people who don't worship demons. Um, Nathan. <laughs> she, but she makes this video and she says the, something to the effect of the reason why men oppose abortion oftentimes is because they don't know how good it feels to kill a child. She's a fairly young woman. I mean, if my memory is correct, she was in her late teens, early twenties at the time. And, you know, I, I won't say that my response on hearing that video was particularly Christian either. <laughs> But in a circumstance like that, how ought we as Christians react? I mean, I don't want to say obviously we pray because that's just a given because it is an important thing to keep reiterating. It's a hard practice to obtain, at least in my case. But I, I don't even know what the appropriate response to that is in the social sphere because that is such a horrific thing to say. I mean, unlike a lot of people who just, talk about abortion and have never actually had to deal with stuff. My background is in medicine. I have had children die in my hands. I know what that feels like. And that's a horrible feeling. So when someone has become so twisted that they view that as a pleasure, what do we do? There's something that's taking control of them. That's a, that's, that's demonic. 
And, and, and you know, but also beyond that, we don't really know why that person's saying it either. Right. right? Unless that person can, can totally unveils themselves, right? And so that's one of the kind of beauties of about being a spiritual father or hearing confessions is that, yeah, maybe that, that girl is saying that on some interview, but then when repentance really comes, the real person comes out, right? It's like an initiation tactic to get into society, like, oh, I would do this. You yeah, know, or I mean, you're cool. Or just to be, just to be um, edgy, you know, edgy, um, and create reaction, you know, there and get attention. Um, there are so many layers to why people do the things that they do, right? And and confession, a lot of those things, those those layers peel off, and so we can actually look and treat people the way in which they ought to be treated for their own healing. Um, Saint Paisius has a wonderful um, section, and I think it's Spiritual Awakening, the book Spiritual Awakening, where somebody asks him about what to do about um, the world when things can be so evil that they um, cause us to have some kind of reaction or to be, um, what's the word that he uses? I forget the word that he uses exactly. Um, but basically when we, we react in a way that's not Christian or, um, if we're scandalized by, by what's going on, St. Paisio says that when somebody of the world does something that scandalizes us, that we have to see within ourselves that the darkness lies in us. And the reason why he says that is because he says, if your very close brother or your mother or your sister or a very, very close friend of yours um, leaves the faith or does something really horrible, your first reaction would be to weep. And he said, since we are all brothers and sisters, um, after Adam and Eve by blood, that our first reaction should be to weep for people. And if we, and th if these are not our first reactions, then we know that the darkness lies inside of us first and foremost, is what he says. So we have to bring ourselves to the point where we have a soft enough heart to be able to have this kind of reaction is when we see things like that happening and we see people so far gone, part of us has to weep because of it. Sometimes that's the case, but it's hard all the time to not just get enraged, you know? Anger is easy. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I do have one finalist question. I think we're rolling up on your, on your time limit here, father. Um, but there's this whole notion, so so prior to Christianity, right, in, in the pagan world and classical antiquity and, and beyond, there's this notion of time being a, a circle, right? Ages repeat themselves. It's the, I believe in Greek, it's anacyclosis, the cycle of regimes, right? And then with the, with the rise of Christianity, we see that kind of turn into a descending or ascending spiral, not so much a circle where things just repeat indefinitely. And this reflects the notion that, well, events don't repeat themselves per se, thematic elements do. Mm -hmm. um, and we can recognize in a previous epic what's going on in a modern epic and kind of perceive the evolution of a, whatever the zeitgeist happens to be. As Peugeot would say, symbolism happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, but with, with that in mind, since we've spent in the West, 50 or so odd years now, um, stacking the bodies of our children like cordwood for our own convenience. Um, what, what does that bode for the coming age or the age that we find ourselves maybe at the end of? Because we've, we're, it seems to me that we're very much in the grip of Molech at the moment and have been for quite some time. And I feel like we're kind of in a middle ground where a lot of people, I hate using the, this term really, but are waking up, I guess you could say. 
but of also, also there's a lot of people who are spiritually blind. I feel like we're like more in the middle than we've ever we've ever been, which also causes a bigger bigger divide, you know. And yeah, I mean, Saint Paul says where where sin is, grace abounds, right? And um, the darker that the world gets, the brighter the church will become to people who haven't seen it yet. So yes, there's definitely an element to that. Um, as far as the world goes into its own psychotic, psychotic spiral, um, people who even are middle ground um, will start to see that there's something more to this life than what they might have thought ever before. Um, and so there is a little bit of that middle ground um, that is happening, maybe, uh, hopefully. And hopefully with repentance, things change and turn around. Um, but for instance, when we went to the, when I was in seminary at St. Vlad's, we had a society called the St. Ambrose Society. It was a pro-life group uh, on campus. And we did prayers at, in front of Planned Parenthoods. And we also went to these March for Life in DC um, every year. And the last year that I went, which I think was 2017, um, it was, it was um, just packed full of people. It was the biggest one they've ever had um, and maybe have grown since that time. But so many young people, um, so many people from all around the United States, and it was really incredible and um, really inspiring uh, to see that. And so there's a growing uh, contingent of young people, even a growing contingent of secular people. Or atheists. There's like Every, atheist pro-life movements, which I think are pretty hilarious. They're, that's epic to me. Yeah. yeah. Like, no, we don't even believe in God, but we don't think murdering a baby is okay. It's wonderful in some ways because there is, um, there is a growing love for the unborn, you know, and a recognition that what we're doing is not okay. Um, and you touched on a little bit that when we, when we put the, we, we, this was upheld by the Supreme Court, for instance, there was uh, little science the, uh, compared to what we have now, right? And so follow the science. Um, we, we now know a baby's heartbeat starts way sooner than people yeah. have. Well, not only that, I mean, now, now we can see what a child looks like in the womb. Now right. we know how a child reacts um, in the womb, including in the way that the child reacts to abortion instruments um, in the womb. And right? that changes a lot of people's minds when they see these videos. And then maybe they'll be like, okay, uh, if there's a heartbeat, then that's when I draw the line. It's like, okay, you're, you're getting closer to, to the truth. Like, you right. know, okay, so now... Two weeks in, okay, that's when I draw the line. Ten days in, and it gets like people start going back and back more. And they're like, you know what? I don't think it's acceptable at all. Hopefully. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's that's one good thing. You know, it's really easy to look at our society and our world and see it going down the drain, uh, which in many facets it is. Um, and it's easy to look at it and see how um, negative it has become or anti-Christian has become. And I think it's good to recognize those things, obviously. I don't think we should turn a blind eye to them. Um, but at the same time, I think that we live in a very good time um, as Orthodox Christians, maybe the best time as Orthodox Christians, if we can really take up our cross and if we can really uh, follow the call to be holy people, because um, there is no more you know, slick American Christianity anymore. There right. is no false um, sense of piety in the Christian life that's acceptable in mainstream society anymore, right? The, the whole curtain has been taken down, right? And um, the masks, if <laughs> the masks of society have been taken off, uh, that's, that's many, not, not all of layered not all comments, of them. any layered comment. Um, but um, now we see we see society for what it really is and what um, it is all stood for, right? Yeah. And so 
that net that might have safeguarded people like, okay, no, America's fine. We, these things are okay. And that those things are okay. This kind of mediocre life is, is quickly dissolving and it's becoming very stark. The contrast, whether that were people that walk in darkness, right. Or people that walk in the light. And yeah, so, as we all have, that's another thing to remember is when, when you, when these situations arise or you hear stories that people have told you about having an abortion or wanting to have one, we have to always remember, like we say in liturgy, you know, that we're all the chief, chief sinner. And it's sometimes hard to remember that when someone commits an act as heinous as that, you still have to remember, you know, the things you've done. Well, um, yeah, I, I know one of the only things that Americans know about history is that the Holocaust was bad, but it's interesting to me. I, I don't know if you've ever read um, Hannah Arendt before. Um, she did wrote Eichmann in Jerusalem. Um, what was the other one? There, there's a couple. There's a couple of interesting books that she's written, but she was very fascinated by the whole problem of evil, right? And she was actually one of the few people present for the Eichmann trial who didn't think that painting him as a this horrific, exceptionally evil, evil moral failure was a good thing because she actually studied his life and interviewed him and listened to everything that he said. And she said, you know, this is not a man who woke up and wanted to kill people. He just was given the chance to do, he, he was given the chance to be really efficient at something and never thought, well, maybe I shouldn't do this thing because what I'm doing is facilitating evil. And it, the, the more and more I think about her work, the more and more I realize that most of us in America, if not all of us in America, are complicit in that way. We've grown used to, well, you protest outside of Planned Parenthood or, you know, you if you're getting coffee or at a bar and you argue with someone about abortion, then you're actually doing something. But ultimately, that's not doing all that much. Um, and by becoming comfortable enough with it that we just think it's a bad thing removed from us, we're participating in this modern holocaust i mean in many ways this far more atrocious holocaust in the same way that eichmann was yeah yeah we need deep repentance as a nation as a as a country you know as a world as the world that's why we see a lot of things uh happening now it's a it's it's due to our sins as a as a world and and we have to think we have to also you know uh, be very honest with ourselves also as a church. Yeah. You know, if, if we were really living the way that our forefathers and foremothers lived, would our nation be so far gone or in where it is now? Right. You know? um, if, if we if we continue to remain silent, you know, St. Paisio says that, you know, the, their an, the ancestors will call out from the graves. You know, we continue to remain silent. If bishops don't say anything, if priests don't say anything, if we continue to just kind of live in this insulated orthodox world and not call out the evil as going on in our society, uh, if we're too scared to say things from the pulpit, if our hierarchs are too scared to pen letters um, or to correct their tweets or anything like that, then we have to really see, we have to really take this responsibility on ourselves as well, because evil will just grow even more and it will breed itself even more if there's no voice of reason to stand up against it. So I, I think we need a lot of repentance. Yeah. I think that's a, a good way, a good way to end this, this video that we've done. We only have a few minutes left because I don't have zoom pro, I guess, first world problems, but <laughs> father, I know there's a lot we didn't touch on and that you have to go and maybe we'll, we'll continue on a different day, but um, sure. I forgot to start by asking you with a prayer. Do you mind if we do a prayer? We have a, we have three minutes left. We have a three minute countdown. So I was just going to say, I was just going to say, let's end with a prayer. Let's end with a prayer. prayer. Okay. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. It is truly me to bless thee, the Theotokos, ever blessed and all blameless and mother of our God, more honorable than the cherubim, beyond compare, more glorious than the seraphim, who without corruption gave his birth to God the word and our truly Theotokos, thee do we magnify. 
Christ has risen from the dead, trampling down death by death, and upon those in the tombs bestowing life. Christ is risen. Truly, he is risen. He is risen. And Christos uh, Anesti. Alethos Anesti. <laughs> and I don't know. I don't know the other ones. There's a lot that are El Romanian. Almasia Kam is what we say. And Akamaka. It's like uh, I don't know how to say it. So. <laughs> That's the one my kids love the most. Akamkam. It's, it's it's very. Uh, it, it's 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 a very good phrase for children. I'll put it yeah. that way. It sounds good for a kid. <laughs> well, Father, thank you so much. Uh, Bless you both. Thank you, thank Father. You. And uh, we'll we'll talk we'll talk soon. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you.